Thank you, Giovanni. Thank you very much for the invitation and for organizing this series of seminars. Also, I'd like to thank Aurelian for uh, the excellent introduction. I don't have to talk about theory, so you heard it all from, from him. And so we can concentrate here on, on practical things. And also very important, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the contribution to this work uh, by uh, the people that you see written on these slides. So our PhD students, Manuel Baumgartner, Viola Krizakova, uh, Giacomo Sala, and our postdoc Eva Grimaldi, as well as our collaborator from the Swiss Light Source, Paul Scherer Institute, where some of the measurements were done. And in particular, the team of Kevin uh, Garello at IMEC, who uh, made samples and contributed to the measurements and interpretations of, of this data. So uh, you've heard uh, from Aurelian uh, how the spin orbit coupling can be harnessed to produce spin and orbital currents. And then these uh, angular momentum currents can be used to uh, manipulate the magnetization. What is really interesting about these uh, so-called spin orbit torques is the fact that you can use them to, uh, uh, to control different effects, for example, magnetization switching, uh, as well as uh, high frequency oscillations, domain wall motion, excitation of uh, spin waves. And also very important, these torques can be used to manipulate the magnetization of different classes of materials. So not only metal structures, but also magnetic insulators, 2D materials, as well as ferromagnets and antiferromagnets. So they really provide a very rich uh, playground for uh, fundamental investigations as well as for applications. Now, the uh, sort of a standard model of spin orbit torques is that uh, you have a bilayer system in which one layer is, for example, heavy metal with strong spin orbit coupling, passing a charge current in this material generates a spin and or an orbital current. And uh, this uh, then uh, angular momentum current accumulates at this interface with a, a magnet. Okay. And as it diffuses into the magnet itself, it then uh, induces spin torques. And these spin torques, as we have heard, can be even or odd in the magnetization. And uh, these are called the damping-like and field-like torques. Okay? They can be seen as the absorption of a magnetization current and the action of an effective um, exchange field on the local magnetization. Okay? If you consider different effects, for example, the rush edelstein effect or the orbital Rush by the stand effect, as well as uh, uh, spin filtering by spin orbit scattering and, and precessional effects, you also get similar kinds of torques. And uh, you can look at torques, but you can also consider the corresponding effective fields, which are often measured instead of the torques. So uh, now if you have this. Uh, torques at end, you can, uh, as I said before, you can manipulate the magnetization so you can replace induction. Magnetization of tiny bits on a hard drive, you can do this by uh, direct current injection into a magnetic structure. And this has been now known for about two decades for uh, spin transfer torques. Uh, and this is also true for uh, spin orbit torques. Okay, so it becomes possible to, to scale down really uh, magnetic bits and to directly uh, manipulate them uh, using electric currents. Uh, these spin torques also enable uh, new directions of research and possible applications, for example, by combining memory and logic functionalities, by exploiting probabilistic computing, neuromorphic computing, uh, as well as uh, computing with waves or magnets. So these are all very interesting avenues for uh, future development. Now, if we uh, stay with a simpler concept of a digital memory, uh, we know that uh, this would be particularly useful in the architecture of uh, computers to uh, realize fast and non-volatile 
uh, memory stages, in particular those that are closer to the to the uh, uh, processor of, of uh, to the CPU or the computer, where speed is important and where non-volatility uh, would enable substantial energy savings. And if we think of spin torques, there's different ways to implement a, a magnetic memory, a random access magnetic memory. And so here you see the typical spin transfer torque device. It's a magnetic tunnel junction to terminal where passing a current through this pillar uh, can induce the switching of the free layer and then the relative orientation of the magnetization in the free layer and reference layer is read out by the tunneling magnetic resistance effect. Now, if you want to use uh, SOT, so spin orbit torques, then you need a third terminal. You need to pass a current uh, in a bottom electrode, as in the scheme here. This will switch the magnetization of the free layer, and then the readout can again be performed by TMR. And there are different also concepts. One can use a, a random racetrack concept, and one can also use vol voltage control of magnetic anisotropy to enhance this effect or even switch magnetization by itself. So now what is interesting here is to realize that uh, the different interactions correspond to different time scales. And so in general, right, in, uh, if we talk about memory applications, we want to have a stable magnetization to ensure the stability of information on a time scale of years. This is enabled by magnetic anisotropy. But at the same time, we would like to switch the magnetization fast. And uh, then we have to see how we can operate on the magnetization. And so if we have external magnetic fields or spin torques, what we are actually doing is acting on the transverse part of the magnetization. So we are changing the transverse component of the magnetization. And this uh, limits the time scales to uh, sort of precessional dynamics. So we are in the uh, nanosecond or, or uh, sort of close to nanosecond regime. On the other hand, if we want to go faster, then we need interactions that affect the exchange, the interaction between atoms. And so where the longitudinal magnetization components are actually modified, and this can be achieved for, by uh, ultra-fast uh, uh, heat-induced demagnetization using femtosecond laser pulses. Now, uh, you'll see that uh, by using uh, spin orbit torques, we can actually induce quite interesting dynamics in, in uh, relatively simple systems. So, um, of course, one of the first uh, approaches or toy model of spin orbit torque induced magnetization dynamic is a, is a macro spin model, which you see uh, uh, here in, in these simulations. So here, what we have is a current pulse in, in blue, and then the, the time traces of the mag magnetization, the uh, Z component, this is a system with perpendicular magnetic anisotropy, X and Y component. And here you see the trajectory, so the magnetization starts here, upstate, then uh, moves along the, uh, this is the Y axis here, and then finally it precesses now. So how can we explain this? Well, as we turn the current on, the uh, spin orbit torque that is most important to realize switching is a damping light component that is orthogonal to the magnetization and this uh, PMA layers. And this uh, forces the magnetization to align along the torque itself, if the torque is sufficiently strong. Right. Now, this would be uh, for the typical geometry of, of ferromagnet heavy metal bilayers, it will be a, a oriented in plane orthogonal to the current direction. So you actually need a symmetry breaking mechanism to uh, force the switching into a, a preferred direction. And this can be achieved usually by an in-plane field. Okay. And by applying an in-plane field, we add a torque and the magnetization actually tilts, uh, in this case, for example, downwards. And when the current pulse is turned off, the magnetization then uh, relaxes towards the down state here. So this is the reason why we need a symmetry breaking mechanism in, in SLT switching, or we need a torque with a different symmetry as also Aurelian has mentioned before. Now, uh, using spin orbit torques, you can switch not only layers with perpendicular magnetic anisotropy, as I said before, but also layers with in-plane anisotropy. And in this case, one doesn't need a, um, a, an external 
field or symmetry breaking mechanism for that. Okay. Uh, important things to realize is that the critical current for switching, this is calculated in a macro spin model, is proportional to the magnetic volume, inversely proportional to the so called SOT efficiency, or if you want the effective spinal angle. And uh, it depends on the magnetic anisotropy of the layers. Okay. So the larger the anisotropy, the harder it is to switch, as uh, can be easily expected. However, if you go to the in-plane configuration, then uh, since the, uh, the damping light torque actually um, you know, reduces the damping and uh, one can take advantage of the, the, the damping factor itself to reduce the critical current uh, required for switching. So these are two uh, different geometries for, for SMT switching. Change. Yes. Now, uh, as you can imagine, microspin model uh, is a is a nice model, simple but uh, not very realistic. Particularly if we're talking about uh, magnets whose dimensions exceed a few nanometers. And so, beyond coherent reversal, we can expect different modes of uh, magnetization switching. So, some of those that have been discussed in the literature are, for example the uh, nucleation of uh, domains thermally assisted and then the propagation of domain wall by uh, the current induced torques and uh, this uh, nucleation of domains and also the, uh, the propagation is actually affected by the presence of the jaloginsky moria interactions in the system and this uh, also uh, creates a very interesting um, dynamics and additional possibility to manipulate magnetization in the system. So to observe how actually the, the uh, spin orbit torque switching occurs in, uh, in a magnetic layer, uh, we perform time and element resolved uh, measurements using a scanning transmission X-ray microscope at the Swiss light source. Here we focused an X-ray beam to a, a, a spot of about 25 nanometers and uh, we have here our sample, which is uh, a magnetic dot uh, sitting on a platinum current line. And we detect the transmission, the transmitted X-ray intensity at the cobalt absorption edge. So we tune the photon energy to this value here where we have the maximum X-ray magnetic dichroism contrast, which gives us sensitivity to the normal component of the magnetization. And we perform pump probe measurements where the pump is a current pulse and the probe is an X-ray pulse. This is how it looks in a schematic. We have our positive and negative current pulses here, and we have our X-rays, um, and we probe the, uh, the magnetization at different instants in time at uh, different um, delay times with respect to the onset of a current pulse. And so this is a sort of a stroboscopic measurements of the dynamics here. So this is our uh, sample holder. The samples are actually sitting here. These are silicon nitride membranes. And what we have on our membrane, these are the two gold electrodes. This is a platinum current line. And here we have a cobalt dot, as you see in this uh, schematic here. And by measuring the transmitted X-ray intensity, we have um, low contrast or high contrast, depending on the orientation of the magnetization in the dot. Now we can perform this uh, pump probe measurements, and this is uh, the typical time traces of the current pulses in red and the integrated XMCD contrast on the dot in black. So what we see here is that as the current uh, is turned on, the magnetization uh, start to change, okay. it switches, and it achieves the opposite state uh, within the, the current pulse, the time of the current pulse. And then as we pulse in the opposite direction, we can revert back to the initial value. In this, the polarity of the switching depends on the orientation of the in-plane field, uh, similar to what I explained before for the macrospin model. And we can see the specially resolved maps here. Let's see if this works. Yes, so this is a, uh, a, a movie showing 
the switching uh, during the arrival of a current pulse, four different orientations of the current in magnetic field. So we've seen positive and negative current and positive field. Now we have a negative field, positive current pulse, sorry, negative current pulse, and then positive current pulse. See if it works. Okay, doesn't work. But what we can derive from these uh, movies is that uh, for every one of these current pulses, we have a different nucleation point, and uh, we have then the propagation of a domain wall in the direction that is diagonal with respect to the current. And this dynamics is very reproducible because otherwise we wouldn't be able to observe it in a, in a pump probe experiment. And uh, this is also uh, really not uh, something that is typical of spin orbit torques that cannot be explained um, without considering all the interactions that enter uh, into such a system. This we do here. So these are uh, just the, the uh, individual frames of these movies where we see the, the four different configurations for different orientation of current and fields. And we see this alternation of nucleation sides and propagation direction. Now, what we think is happening here is that uh, we have dot with out of plane magnetization, but also Jaruzinski Mori interaction that tilts the magnetization at the edges of the dot. And as we apply the external field that is required to break the symmetry in SOT switching, one side of the dot has a uh, magnetization is more tilted and the other one less. So this is the preferred side for nucleation of a domain wall. And when the current pulse is on, then the damping like torque and the field like torque uh, both determine the uh, nucleation point. And so it turns out that the field like torque is what determines this offset along the uh, uh, vertical direction here, whereas the damping like torque or the sign of the current determines the side of the dot where the switching begins. Now, uh, these data also show that uh, the, the field-like torque plays a role in the switching, in particular by uh, lowering the barrier for, for magnetization switching, the anisotropy barrier. And this we see by applying an external field that can actually um, counteract or assist the field-like torque. And depending on the uh, magnitude of this field, we can change the threshold voltage for switching from high to low value when two fields are uh, assisting each other. And the field like torque also increases the reversal speed as well as modifies the tilt of the domain wall during propagation. These are simulations. By the way. Another important thing is that this uh, peculiar magnetization dynamics that is the ideal one, the one I showed you before, is not unique. So we have dots that present defects. We don't know exactly what these defects are. They can be, for example, lower magnetization at some point or uh, lower magnetic anisotropy at the edges or the center of the dot. But still, what we observe experimentally as well as in simulation is that the uh, SOT switching is very robust. It happens always in a uh, reproducible and consistent way. Um, even in the presence of people. So this is very encouraging because then we can really use this method for applications. And in fact, there have been different uh, uh, proposals and demonstrations of uh, SOT switching in magnetic tunnel junctions, both perpendicular and uh, different types of in-plane junctions with magnetization orthogonal or parallel to the current. Now, what is interesting about these devices is that now we have three terminal devices. And so we have actually different effects that uh, can be used to uh, manipulate the magnetization. So uh, one is the uh, spin transfer torque. Okay. Spin transfer torque uh, is produced by the uh, spin polarized current flowing across the free layer and then uh, acting on the magnetization of, of the, sorry, flowing across the reference layer, acting on the magnetization of the free layer. And uh, this torque, since it is collinear to the uh, quiescent direction of the free layer magnetization, it needs a sort of activation time um, 
in order to be non-zero, in order to uh, act on the uh, transverse component of the magnetization of the free layer. The spin orbit torque, on the contrary, is immediately active because it is by uh, geometry, it is orthogonal to the direction of the magnetization at rest. So it has an immediate action, as we have seen also in the microspin simulation. And on top of these two torques, we also have a, a third effect, which is uh, the voltage control of magnetic anisotropy that comes from the bias applied to the STT electrode. So to the top electrode, which uh, essentially uh, changes the anisotropy of the three layer by a charge transfer effect at the interface between the tunnel barrier and, and the free layer. So all these effects play a role. And in fact, there is uh, uh, even a fourth effect that is very important as I will show in the next uh, minutes. So uh, we perform these measurements on magnetic tunnel junctions designed by uh, Kevin uh, Garello at IMEC, which you see here, these are uh, made uh, using a, a, a bottom tungsten, beta tungsten electrode. They have then a cold iron boron free layer and reference layer separated by an MGO bearer and then a synthetic antiferromagnet to stabilize the free layer. And uh, uh, so they have a TMR of around 100%, very uh, stable and relatively large magnetic anisotropy. What we do to measure the uh, dynamics of the magnetization in this system is to uh, use a pulsar. We split the current pulse into uh, two uh, lines. One is connected to the bottom, to the um, SOT electrodes. One is connected to the STT electrode. And uh, we can vary the amplitude and sign of the pulses that enter into each of this channel, and then monitor uh, essentially the TMR using a fast oscilloscope. So we have real-time measurements of switching in this system. And if we perform time average, so sorry, time resolved, but uh, measurements, but averaged over many traces, this is what we see for uh, switching that is uh, almost purely SOT and purely STT. Okay. And we see that uh, we do achieve switching in, in all time, in, in all cases, but the uh, traces show that uh, some uh, very uh, uh, notable differences, in particular in the transition time, delta T, as well as the presence of an incubation time or a delay time T uh, node here, that is not expected in SOT, but is actually expected in STT. So to understand what is going on here, we have to look at uh, single shot uh, traces of individual switching events. And this is again for STT only, where we see this very long transition times and also uh, long uh, incubation times. And as we go to mostly SOT, then uh, we also observe uh, this rather long incubation times that we didn't expect at the beginning for the reasons that I said before, that the torque is orthogonal to the magnetization. Uh, however, we observe that as we reverse the bias on the STT electric, which here is uh, negative, which means that the STT and VCMA actually oppose SOT switching. If we reverse the sign of this bias, we achieve much faster and uniform switching, as you see in these traces here. And if we increase the in-plane field, then we really go to sub-nanosecond switching with a very narrow distribution of switching time, which is also what we see in this, uh, in this uh, distribution plots here for the incubation, the transition time, and the total switching time. So, now this phenomenon of uh, having a, a, a delay time and then a transition time is not only found in tunnel junctions and in ferromagnetic materials, but also, uh, for example, in ferry magnets, despite the, uh, the fact that they're considered to be very fast uh, switching materials. Okay. The, here we have uh, measurements carried out not in a tunnel junctions, but in a, in a 
cadmium iron cobalt dot on the platinum current line using a, a time resolved whole effect technique that is described in this paper. And what we see again is this type of traces where we have a finite delay time and then a transition time. And uh, we also see that we can reduce this both times by increasing the SOT bias or the SOT current. Okay, these are the distributions. What are the um, what is the origin of this SOT switching delay? Uh, well, again, if we perform micromagnetic simulations at high current in the uh, so-called intrinsic regime, we see that uh, these are the switching traces simulated. The incubation time is practically zero, as expected from this simple microspin consideration. However, if we reduce the current, even in macrospin, in sorry, micromagnetic simulations, we observe a finite uh, delay time here. And the reason for this delay time is actually due to, to the fact that the magnetic anisotropy in this junctions or in this uh, simulations is rather strong. And so uh, the torque itself is not enough to uh, trigger the uh, nucleation of a reverse domain. And uh, the switching is actually assisted by thermally induced heating. This is the current pulse. This is the temperature simulated during the current pulse. This temperature increase causes a reduction of MS, but more important, importantly, a reduction of magnetic anisotropy. And so uh, this uh, thermal assisted behavior is the uh, origin of the incubation time. Okay. okay, so heating also plays a role, big role. And uh, so we have actually four effects that play a role in a three terminal magnetic tunnel junction. And we can quantify their effect. We can actually disentangle them from each other by noting that uh, the voltage control of magnetic anisotropy depends linearly on the STT bias, uh, the spin transfer torque as well, but its sign depends on the orientation of the reference layer, which we can control. And the self-heating due to the current flowing in the MTJ goes as, as the square of the line bias. And so uh, using this in our data, we can quantify what is the effect of each one of these uh, three um, things that you see here. So voltage control of magnetic anisotropy, STT and heat on SOT switching. And we see that the PCMA plays actually the larger role, STT a minor role, and heat uh, a role that depends on the relative uh, uh, ratio of the uh, STT to SOT bias here. So I'm approaching the conclusion. I see that Giovanni is showing up here. But what is important to say is that uh, by combining these four effects, we can actually realize uh, not only reduce the critical voltage, but make the switching faster and, and also uh, overall achieve a critical uh, energy for switching that is lower. Uh, in this uh, VCMA and heat assisted SOT switching, then it is in just purely STT switch. So that's uh, quite relevant. And of course, one can think of different materials to improve the spin orbit torque efficiency and that would make the, the switching current even lower. So uh, I will skip this. If there are questions, I can come to, to feel free switching. And these are my conclusions. Thank you very much for your attention.